hey guys sorry instagram cuts me off after an hour and so i have to re get it going so i'm just gonna wait for everyone to join that's gonna join hey guys thanks for joining me again thanks for joining me again sorry i know i can only go live for an hour it's kind of annoying but um it's not too big of a deal Thoughts on dim as a source of cruciferous vegetables. Dim is not a cruciferous vegetable. Dim is found in cruciferous vegetables, and I am not a huge fan of dim. I've seen it be more damaging to women than actually helpful. There's so many women that have gotten so many problems from dim, um, and it's because dim is like, you're, you know, when we start to really pull different compounds from specific foods and we start to take them in high amounts we we run the risk of not understanding if the body was ever meant to get that compound in that high amount and of course it can be therapeutic and of course it can be um, beneficial but <laughs> a lot of times people just think like direct benefit is like oh it's just benefiting me yet their hair is like falling out in clumps and they're like they have a rash on their back and they're like but I, f I feel fine like I feel good and I'm like probably not a good idea so I would rather you get your dim from um, other things like actual broccoli or actual cauliflower um, but the overemphasis on dim or like the act like people act like dim is like this holy grail of liver detox and I'm like it doesn't work like that dim is just one substance needed in a list this long of substances needed for liver detoxification and what's the odds that it's going to be dim that's the problem with your estrogen detoxification what about endotoxins in the gut what about protein what about um how much sugar you're getting a day or carbohydrates what about um taurine and glycine and l-methionine and you know there's so many things that are needed B vitamins specifically, which a lot of women with PCOS are deficient in, that like DIM is like the last thing on my list. And I've seen it done more, do more harm than good in most women. And a lot of nutritionists give it out like candy. They're like, oh my gosh, everyone's saying DIM is so good for you. And I'm like, most women that I see on DIM are going freaking crazy and their hair is falling out. So in my opinion, I don't really think that it's always that good of a thing. Like it's really an overhyped thing and you get plenty from vegetables, but I'll let you guys do your own research and experimentation on that. I'm not against it, but I just have seen more harm done than good. What do you think about vegan, vegan cheese for PCOS? So if you've been around for a while or you don't um, already know, um, we know that veganism does not work for women with PCOS. It's horrible for women with PCOS. It actually causes a lot more stress. It's it's actually contraindicated. There's quite a many doctors that talk about how vegan diets do not work with women with PCOS because of the metabolic dysregulation it causes. Protein is needed in 100 grams per day. And remember that plant sources of protein are only absorbed in about 15% of plant sources are absorbed as opposed to um, animal sources, usually around 40 to 50% of the protein is absorbed. So that's quite a big jump. So you're going to have to eat massive amounts of protein from plants in order to get enough protein. But the caveat there is that vegan and vegetarian proteins are usually also high in carbohydrates and high in starches and women with PCOS have gut issues a lot of the times lots of times have small intestinal bacteria overgrowth at any time that you're consuming high amounts of starch you are just telling these bugs and these bacteria feast in my gut feast and that can be a problem so you're not having any pro you're not having enough protein to let the liver detoxify and so you're feeding these bacteria it's a bunch of starchy proteins which is growing endotoxins which is inflaming your cells and making more and more insulin resistant so veganism for people with pcos is an absolute disaster it's a disaster like it to me like whenever someone comes to me and we have to transition them off sometimes it takes three months just to heal the damage that was done by vegan veganism alone and then we have to actually like work on PCOS so and, like I'm very passionate about it just because I see so many w women suffer from it now a lot of times like these really intense crazy diets help us really get away from the standard American diet and get off of oils um, industrial seed oils and things which is very helpful for your metabolism so that's why we see like direct benefit and we're thinking like oh we're seeing benefit so it must be working for us but remember it takes about a year or two to really deplete your tissues of all the amino acids that you built up from eating animal foods and then that's when you start to see the shit really hit the fan and it just your hair starts falling out and you start to get acne and you start to get see your 
libido go in the trash can because remember veganism was created by monks to actually kill their sexual libido because they couldn't have sexual urges and could not have sex so they would actually eat um, they saw that a diet low in animal foods killed their libido and killed their desire for sex and so it was actually created by the monks <laughs> and so um, that's actually where it originates from I, a follower brought that to my attention and I looked into it and I was like holy moly I didn't even realize that so that should really scare us because our libido is literally a marker for our vitality and our our, our um, desire to procreate and reproduce and remember that the woman's biological purpose although it's not your personal purpose I'm not saying that that's your your only desire should be to have children it's just that your body's desire is that and so if your libido is gone there's a, a serious issue it's a marker for your vitality but that's a long story for saying that I don't really love vegan cheese <laughs> or anything that is a, a vegan substitute for a true food because it's processed, it's manufactured, and it's made in an industrial setting. Your body has never had to adapt to consuming or breaking that down until this generation. Veganism, like we've see, we see it, has never existed before in the history of time. The history of time. And so we are running a true huge risk when we um, take out huge, huge, huge things from our diet. Thank you so much. I'm learning so much. I'm so glad. Thank you for being here. Thoughts on ozone therapy. Honestly, you guys, ozone therapy can actually be really stressful to the body. Um, providing the body with too much oxygen that it can more than it can handle can actually cause more stress in, in the metabolism itself. Um, I actually like carbon dioxide therapy better. So like something as simple as breathing into a paper bag, like hyperventilating, duh, um, can actually be more therapeutic than ozone therapy. So um, anything that induces carbon dioxide is actually um, a lot better than anything that like brings... Um, oxygen too high but if it works for you wonderful there's a lot of people that promote it um but from my research it can it can have its own caveats because i'm always looking for the other side of the story like whenever something's being promoted as a beneficial thing and there's like nothing that could go wrong right i'm always looking for the thing that could go wrong just to make sure that if i recommend it it's not going to hurt someone's health because i take my recommendations very seriously and i never integrate something into my practice or recommend it to you guys until I know for sure it's not gonna cause more harm than good. Hey, I have healthy iron, hemoglobin levels, but low ferritin. What do you think could cause that and how to treat it? Honestly, you guys, like iron is something that's so overhyped these days. Um, ferritin could be low simply for the fact that you have low B12, um, low B6. You could have low thyroid function. You could just not be getting enough iron from your diet, nutrients. Um, there's like so many things that could, it could be. And it, usually it's, it's, it's a piece to a bigger metabolic issue. The iron itself is not the problem. Supplementing iron is a, usually a horrible idea. Um, I really like strongly point my clients away from it if possible just because it feeds pathogens in the gut so bad like you'll, you'll notice if you've ever taken an iron supplement you get super constipated um, yeah it's because the bacteria are like just having a feast and it's just so bad for your digestive tract so if you need to supplement iron you can always do like beef liver or um, you know, having a steak, a big juicy steak once a week, um, things like that. Um, and you know, you might go and check your, your ferritin levels in six months from now and they might be fine. So it's one of those things where, um, as long as your iron and hemoglobin levels are good, I wouldn't really obsess about it too much. But if your doctor brought it to your concern, then of course, um, listen to your doctor. Hi, how should I start when first trying to adjust PCOS? It feels so like there is so many different things out there. Yeah, so the first thing that I tell my clients is to unfollow anyone that makes them feel confused. Um, I always say you have to filter through information. So a lot of times we make the mistake of just getting information from so many sources. We type something in Google and we start reading articles and we just take everything as if it was fact, like as if, as if that person uh, knows everything, which they obviously don't, right? They're coming from their own experience. They're coming from um, maybe a scientific background Background. Um, and you don't know like if they were the bottom of their class in dietitian school like a lot of people are like oh they're a dietitian and I'm like you don't care if they literally are really good at taking tests and they never studied in their life like you don't know those things so you need to really look at somebody's story you have to look at somebody's um, other information before you assess some information you say that that's fact for me a good rule of thumb for me is I always look at the first thing is if it's coming from a fear mongering or authoritarian style of teaching like if you don't do this this is going to happen to you um, 
I, it's immediately out in my book because to me that is a horrible way to teach. It shows that the person that is writing that or talking about it doesn't understand both sides to the story. For me, I always teach in a way that says, this is the facts, but I understand why you do this because this is what you were taught, blah, blah, blah. If I ever say, you should do this or you're going to do this uh, or this is going to happen to you, please unfollow me because that's a horrible way to be and it, it shows that you're stupid. You don't have both sides of the story. You don't understand the, the full information. And so that's the first way I decipher through information. If anybody says anything that's fear-based, fear-mongering, they're out. They're just out. The second thing I always say is if they're cutting a huge food group out, like dairy, like meat, like something that you might commonsensically get a check in your consciousness like hmm I wonder if that might cause some severe damage to my health I hope you would you would think about it before you just cut something out like that um you should really question it if anyone just says that the answer is cutting a food group out they clearly don't understand biochemistry they don't understand cellular health they don't understand nutrition at all they might like have heard something through the grapevine like telephone and they're just like regurgitating information and so you need to kind of make sure that um that's not happening and then you also need to understand you guys like you always need to be able to take a step back and ask yourself is all the information, is everyone talking about the same thing? Because nothing is ever as it seems. And if you automatically think something is something, like for example, you know, you automatically think gluten and dairy is super bad for PCOS and you automatically think that in your head that's a firm, strong belief and you're like, you have a very tribal feeling about that. Like you strongly believe that dairy and gluten is going to cause PCOS symptoms and you strongly feel Remember that anything tribal like that or anything that like really overrides your ability to see reason um, is probably not correct, unfortunately. So, you know, I always say, how does the information make you feel? Does it fit your common sense or does it make you question your intuition and your gut feeling? You always say like, hmm, I've always felt it was different than that. I always say that trusting your body is so much better than trusting any information that you find on the internet because I would say probably 95% of it is incorrect. I've sometimes, you know, for fun, just type in like some, some topic having to do with PCOS and I just like read through articles and I'm just like false, 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 false. Like I just can't even handle it. Like it irritates me so much. So there's really a lot of just bad information out there, unfortunately. And it's super important to do what feels right, to eliminate distractions, to find a plan that works for your body and just focus down, laser focus on your body, laser focus on yourself. Your body always tells you what it needs. And I don't care what anyone says. I've heard doctors talk about PCOS nutrition and be absolutely beyond false like everything that they say is not even like scientifically inaccurate like scientific literature I could put a stack of papers and hand it to them and say uh, this is all the reasons why you're wrong I could just listen to a, a podcast by someone I really respect who had a doctor on uh, for PCOS and I was just mind boggled at the amount of false information she was sharing as a doctor a functional medicine doctor and I was just like that is shocking to me. And a lot of times it's actually like implements a lot of food fear into women. They're afraid of things. They're afraid of eating things. They don't even know what to eat. Like if you've gotten to a point where you don't even know what you should be eating, that's something wrong. So that was a long way of saying that really eliminate your sources of information to a few people that you truly trust that know are you know are going to bring at least do their bre breast <laughs> do their best to bring you the the right information to the best of their abilities obviously everyone is human Obviously everyone makes mistakes. Like I've talked about recently how I was promoting like low carb and keto style of eating for a very long time. And now I've, I've slowly transitioned myself over for very many reasons. And that was me. I did the best of my ability until I realized my ability was bigger, larger, and I had to slowly shift it over and admit that I didn't know everything. And so now I know more and I have to, you know, honor that. And so Follow a few people um, and start with baby steps, simple things. Remember, it's all about taking off stress when it comes to PCOS, not adding on more stress. So a lot of times we add in like, I need to be doing this and I need to be doing this. And there's a million things that you need to be doing. And yet you forget like, what you should actually be doing, which is like eat um, regular periodic meals throughout the day to get balanced blood sugar. Um, make sure you're sleeping well, make sure you're moving, make sure you're getting out in nature, getting enough sun, 
making sure you're avoiding inflammatory foods that don't work for your body, that irritate your gut and your digestive tract, make your skin act up, make you feel like crap. Those are the things you should stay away from, not because somebody told you to, but because you truly don't feel good when you eat them. Um, and um, just simple strategies. You know, if you wake up in the morning and chug coffee, you should probably drink some warm water and eat a break some breakfast and then drink your coffee so it doesn't spike your blood sugar. You know, you're already gonna do those things anyways. You just kind of move the order around. So the biggest thing for PCOS really comes to down to stress and where are your personal stressors. If you're not already eating healthy, balanced meals, that contain enough protein, carbs, and fat. That's really the first place to start. But things like sleep and exercise and filtering your water are also equally important. So it's just kind of like you taking in where you're at and choosing one thing to get started with. And I usually say like one or two things per week is usually a good plan. I'm going through questions. Um, is Vital Proteins Collagen Peptides a good product? It's overhyped. It's just collagen peptides put into a fancy little container and sold for, you know, 20 bucks more. I usually use Great Lakes. Um, there's also a new product on Amazon, fairly new, called Zint that I've been using. Um, they sell like a huge bag for a really low cost though, so I'm like worried it's maybe not the right thing. Like I keep buying it, but then I'm like, oh, I don't know, man. Like this is too good of a price to be true. So I, I go back to Great Lakes because I trust them and they're like a local farm. Many women with PCOS claim they were healed with raw veganism. What the F? I think they're just getting a detox reaction that will die out. No way eating raw vegetables only can get rid of such a complex metabolic syndrome. A lot of people tout that they, like veganism healed their, their problems. I've had like multiple vegan nutritionists actually come to me as clients and they don't even have their periods. So don't ever re like believe anything that you read on social media. So many times people don't even know what markers of health are. Like they'll say like, oh, I lost all this weight and so therefore it made me healthier and I'm like losing weight could mean you were literally eating through all your muscles like I don't know where that weight came from I need to know about your period your cycle your your boob health you know I want to see your progesterone levels I want to make sure you're ovulating how are your temperatures are they 98.6 or are you you know, just clear in 95. You know, there's so many like little factors that are so much better indicators of metabolic and like actual health than somebody just saying like, I lost weight on this. Like I'm like, weight loss can actually be very stressful on the body if you do it wrong because you're releasing all the shit that's in your fat cells and now your liver has to process it like very quickly. And so it's like people that just use weight loss as a gauge for health don't understand that the weight was gained due to metabolic stress. And so proper way to lose weight is to heal metabolic stress. You don't have to actually force yourself to lose weight. Like it will, um, your body will burn sugar quicker and actually get through that fuel that's stored in your fat cells properly rather than forcing it. And that's, you know, there's a, a difference there. But anyways, raw veganism, rarely works for women. A lot of times it's a detox reaction because raw vegans um, don't do a lot of fat at all. Um, and my, like the biggest problem with fats is the polyunsaturated fats. Um, they do do like a little bit of nuts here and there, but not enough to really like make a huge difference in the way that the metabolism functions. So I think a lot of times the success when it comes to veganism is people are focusing really heavily on sugars, um, specifically fruit sugars and whole sugars if they're doing like a whole vegan diet, which is actually very helpful Full, but you know uh, again saturated fats and protein help you metabolize those sugars better now polyunsaturated fats are a different story they put a wet tamp towel on your metabolism and so I think just like the addition of more sugar carbohydrates and the removal of all fats including the damaging ones the, the plant fats um, can end up being helpful for the short term but eventually like around the year mark once the muscles and the tissues begin to um, the body has pulled all it can from the bones and things like that then you start to actually develop nutrient deficiencies and once you become deficient in a nutrient you guys have to understand that there's a difference between not getting enough nutrients in your diet and then becoming deficient in a nutrient meaning that it's going to take a while to actually build your body's stores back up and then on top of it get enough from your diet um because your body's going to be going through that nutrient very quickly for a very long time. Like you're almost not going to be able to get enough. And so like when it comes to healing from veganism or healing from a raw vegan diet or a vegetarian diet or 
anything like that, it sometimes can take a, a really long time to restore the nutrients that have been um, depleted and or the ones you've become completely deficient in that your body has had to compensate for um, and then get your body to actual optimal function. It's, it, it, it's a process. It's, it's very difficult to, um, you know, it, it can take some time. Best ways to prevent as opposed to treat post-pill acne. Is it true it can take months to show up? You know, it's true, but usually like in people that are susceptible, like I've seen, at least in clients that go off the pill, um, a lot of times clients go off the pill before they talk to me. They don't actually talk to me before they quit the pill, which I understand. They just want to get off of it for whatever reason. Um, but I can help them sometimes like support their bodies just nutrient wise before they get off um, to kind of mitigate the effects. So it usually shows up around that two month or three month mark. So that's like usually when I see it. Um, anytime, if it's like after that mark, um, it might never show up. So it's really hard to know. Um, I just recommend making sure your liver is detoxifying really well. You're getting plenty of nutrient dense foods. You're not in a super stressful time of your life. Like it's not a great time to quit the pill when you're like, you know, studying for finals and your boyfriend just broke up with you and you're moving, you know, like really like kind of maybe choose a time on your schedule where you can set aside some time to take care of yourself, set aside some time to sleep, you know, just like things like that. Like you want to be conscious of how much stress you're going to be under, if you're going to be able to, you know, provide yourself with nutrient dense foods or if you're going to kind of be on the go all the time. So I would really recommend just encouraging liver support, encouraging the thyroid, metabolic foods that are easy to digest and absorb and um, just taking it one day at a time. Sometimes it's enough. Um, preventing post pill acne is as much as making sure that estrogen is detoxifying as quickly as possible and you go back to ovulating normally so that you can make progesterone to cancel all that estrogen out. Yesterday I saw a post about veganism making libido better. I was laughing and thought about what you taught us. Yeah, I know. It's sad, guys. I follow a girl that made her toddler vegan, which I personally think should be illegal. I, I, I think that a lot of people should be able to choose a lot of things about their children. But if you're going to restrict something that's going to actually affect their their the um, their, your child's ability to develop a, a proper sized brain, um, I think that that should not be allowed. <laughs> Because sometimes like people say, well, my, my child is super healthy. And remember, we know that health does not always look, um, like health on the inside does not always reflect on the outside. It can sometimes take years. And development of a child, um, you know, when you're feeding your, your, bo your baby in utero, meaning that what you eat while you're pregnant will affect your child. And then um, that sets them up for development throughout their whole life like 10, 15, 20 years. And so like for the people that say like, my baby's happy and healthy, I'm like, well, why don't you check back with me in 15 to 20 years to make sure that they developed testicles? You know, like let's just be scientific and honest here. I have six cysts on each ovary. Is that normal? My hormone test came back normal. Um, it just depends. Like uh, what you guys have to understand is remember that polycystic ovarian syndrome and ovarian cysts are very different things. Polycystic ovaries just means many follicles showing up on an ultrasound. It means that you are not ovulating. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is simply a non-ovulation problem. You have so many metabolic stressors in your life that your body literally does not want to reproduce. So it's about eliminating those metabolic stressors. When it comes to actually developing ovarian cysts, which are inflamed and large cysts on the ovaries that can burst at any time. Those are two completely separate um, problems. An inflamed and large cyst is not a polycystic ovary. And I know it's confusing, you guys. The name is super confusing, but they are two completely separate uh, situations. And so I don't know what you're talking about when you come to cysts. Having six large inflamed cysts on each ovary would be problematic and not normal but if you're just having six polycystic ovaries or many of your follicles are showing up that would make sense if you hadn't ovulated recently should I stop cutting gluten and dairy in my PCOS diet? Um, I do recommend cutting gluten, and if you react to dairy, then it's probably a good idea to keep it out for a while. But gluten is usually a, a, a strong, I'm, I'm seriously not a fan of gluten. It just, again, damp cloth on your metabolism. If you want your, your, um, your metabolism really functioning at a high metabolic rate, then uh, you wanna avoid inflammatory foods. And unfortunately, a lot of people's digestive systems, systems, systems are super messed up right now, and they just can't handle the stress that is gluten in a normal optimally functioning digestive tract go for it but um, unfortunately a lot of women with, women with PCOS already have damaged um, intestines they're not really absorbing nutrients 
properly. And so, um, it's best to just kind of, um, keep gluten out of the diet for a while. What are the good sources of sugar and carbs? Um, it just depends on what works for your body. Obviously it's best to get them from whole sources. I really love fruits and roots. I always say that's a great rule is roots and fruits. Um, then, you know, I talk about and fully nourished. I, I dive into this is grains are not always bad, but it's really where your body is at. That is what determines if grains are bad or not. Some women do really well on glute, some gluten-free grains in their diet, like sprouted oatmeal, um, gluten-free, like really processed gluten-free bread, just because it's like they, their body doesn't have to digest it and break it down. It's already been processed, like made out of white rice flour or whatever. And then some women really see that they just gain a lot of weight with grains. And that's not because the grains themselves are causing the problem. It's because it's feeding bacteria that is making you more insulin resistant. Because remember, bacteria in the gut creates LPS, lipopolysaccharides, or endotoxins, which get into the bloodstream, which inflames your cell, which makes them more resistant to insulin. So it's that vicious cycle. And so really like optimizing um, or finding the right carbohydrates that work for you is really comes down to experimentation. I recommend gluten-free grains that are already kind of processed, so broken down. Quick oats, um, gluten-free breads, things like that if you're gonna do grains. I wouldn't do like a harsh, like I'm gonna make some buckwheat or quinoa and like try to get my body to digest that straight seed. Like probably gonna cause some irritation there. Um, but roots and fruits tend to be easier to digest. So in-season fruits, wonderful. Um, in-season fruit juices, if you can handle them. Some people that are insulin resistant can't handle juices at first. And remember, it always has to be in context. It always has to be combined with a protein and a fat to slow absorption and make sure your cells metabolizing it properly. And so just kind of depends, but in season, ripe fruits are wonderful. Roots like carrots, sweet potatoes, potatoes, um, parsnips, beets, anything that is a squash, you know, anything that is a fruit, root vegetable, um, like a squash, anything that has seeds like zucchini is a fruit. Um, and what else? Um, and some natural sugars, if you can tolerate them well, you know, remember that carbs and sugar are quick energy for the body. And so you have to think about what's going to sustain me long term. Um, raw honey and coconut sugar and date syrup and all of those natural sources of sweeteners like maple syrup and even organic cane sugar is very quick fuel for the body. Your body can, it actually gets digested through the stomach. And so by the time that your food gets into your intestine, that has already been absorbed as energy, like boom, boom, boom. Yet, remember that when sugar speeds up the metabolism, your body has to be equipped to handle the sugar. It has to have the right nutrients. It has to be able to burn sugar. Remember, enough T3 or thyroid hormone is needed to burn sugar. And so sometimes when our metabolisms are suboptimally functioning, a quick digesting form of sugar doesn't get burned in the cell. It gets stored as energy for later in the fat cell. And so um, it just kind of depends on the person. Everyone's very different, but usually Usually good sources to stick to when you're insulin resistant or have really bad blood sugar problems is roots and fruits and then gluten-free based grains here and there um, for the most part. I would stick to roots and fruits mostly though. And then later on, once your metabolism is, is more optimally functioning and it's working a lot better, you might be able to handle some sugar, like some literal sugar. I don't care where it comes from. <laughs> Sugar is not as toxic as it's being made out to be. I think it's because the keto industry is so big. They're like sh sh um, like hiding the fact that it's been known for 20 years that insulin resistance is caused by free fatty acids in the blood. Like that's scientific fact. Like there's no like ifs about it. Like, wait, we thought it was sugar, too much sugar in the bloodstream. Like when people say that too much sugar in the bloodstream causes insulin resistance, they are literally wrong. Like that is a dead wrong sentence. It's not like, oh, it's still up for debate. There's no debate here. We know that it's caused by free fatty acids and inflammation the cell stops responding to insulin because it's no longer burning glucose properly and so why would it respond to a hormone that allows glucose into the cell if it's not able to burn the glucose and so therefore the glucose stays in your bloodstream insulin levels remain high and it's an effect of a metabolic issue it's not a cause of a metabolic issue Obviously reversing insulin resistance is a good idea, but it doesn't happen by like focusing on reversing insulin resistance. Like it's, it's happening for a reason and we have to fix the reason, which is stress, inflammation, um, improper liver function, and just not enough nutrients in general. Um, I, are, I already started to eat clean, but recently I always experienced hot flashes before my period. 
Hmm. Yeah, you know, I uh, a lot of times hot flashes are caused by estrogen, and so maybe you're not detoxifying estrogen well. Um, a lot of times I implement with my clients just making sure they're eating a carrot every single day before they start their period. Sometimes they need to also eat mushrooms, which can bind to estrogens. Um, doing chlorophyll in your water can sometimes be helpful. Um, implementing milk thistle can be helpful. So there's a lot of different... Um, things that you can implement. The goal there is just to really support estrogen detoxification so that estrogen is actually getting out of the body and not being circulated, but then reabsorbed by the body. How can one lower high testosterone levels naturally? I got an IUD and love it because of the of no estrogen hormones, but now I'm having trouble trying to balance out my high levels of testosterone. Yeah, so remember that hormonal IUDs have do not have progesterone in them. They have progestins, which act a lot like testosterone and act a lot like estrogen in the body. And so um, unfortunately, a lot of women think that when they get hormonal IUDs that they're eliminating estrogens, but you have to understand that the synthetic progesterone in an IUD acts very much like estrogen and very much like testosterone in the body. And so a lot of times you see women with hormonal IUDs just have wrecked hormones because um, the body's response to these synthetic hormones is to raise testosterone in order to protect the reproductive organs from the damaging synthetic steroids. So, um, you know, honestly, I'm not sure if you have a lot of women honestly have high testosterone due to their Mirena IUD or hormonal IUD. Um, I'm assuming it's a hormonal IUD um, and not a copper IUD. Um, if it is um, high testosterone is usually due to inflammation. Remember how I always talk about how when your body's under metabolic stress, whether you have a low thyroid function or you're reacting to chemical stressors, your body has to raise stress hormone, right? Cortisol is usually the first one. You've probably heard of adrenal issues. Cortisol is the hormone that they secrete. They also secrete adrenaline. Um, these hormones, their main job is so like, for example, if you were running from an angry bear, you would be very thankful that your body was secreting cortisol because it would break down your tissues. Your body knows you're not going to stop and eat a three course meal so that you can run a marathon away from an angry bear. And so in a very acute situation of stress, your body knows it has to create its own fuel because your body's going to go through fuel very quickly when you're running or you're in a, a, a survival fight or flight mode. And so the function of stress hormones, specifically cortisol and adrenaline, is to break down your tissues in order to turn them into sugar to fuel your cells. And so, um, you know, in order to protect the tissues, right, we need to make sure that certain tissues are not going to be broken down in, in stress. Um, specifically, the brain, the heart, and the lungs, which are your vital organs, are very high in two hormones, two androgenic hormones, testosterone and DHEA, which actually protects them from being broken down when stress levels are high. And so I believe that in hormonal imbalances, when testosterone is high, it is a actual, a, your body's response to a stressor. It is the way that your body's actually protecting its tissues because the only thing more powerful than estrogen, and estrogen is very damaging to reproductive organs, damaging to the brain in, in high amounts, the only thing more powerful than estrogen or synthetic hormones is testosterone. And so you often see your body compensating with testosterone and DHEA in order to protect the tissues under stress. And so actually forcing testosterone down is a horrible idea for people that are under stress because it's the only way that your body's protecting you. And so the goal when it comes to testosterone is, is not even to focus on the testosterone at all. It's actually to focus on what is causing stress in my life that could be raising testosterone. Is it inflammation? Do I have digestive issues? Um, am I being exposed to a chemical every day unknowingly or is it your IUD you know like so there's so many factors that could be playing a part and I'm not saying it is your IUD um, but it could very well be I've seen many women you know grow facial hair and get acne um, when they're on the hormonal IUD not because that IUD is causing it the IUD is causing stress the, the synthetic hormones in there are causing stress on the body if you take vitamin C with iron supplement, can that help with stress on the gut from iron supplementation? Doctor recommended iron and vitamin C for low ferritin. Yeah, regularly doctors will recommend iron for low ferritin because it's that kind of like 
diagnose, treat, prescribe type of um, idea that they were taught in medical school. That's how you treat a dysfunction. And um, this is no, no poo poo on them. They do wonderful work a lot of times, but um, iron uh, is very stressful to detoxify, unfortunately. Um, even if you're taking vitamin C with it, you guys, like iron is such a harsh mineral. Like, would you ever be like, oh, I'm deficient in gold, so I'm just gonna take some straight up 50 milligrams of gold. Like, it's the same thing. Like, iron is needed, but it's like being really overemphasized in our culture. There's so much iron in everything. You could literally cook in a cast iron pan and probably get your iron levels up. Ferritin is usually low due to other issues, and it is not usually an iron problem, especially if your iron and your hemoglobin levels 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 are good. And so it sometimes is, um, anytime something's low or high, you always have to ask, like, what's the body doing? Is it compensating? Is it doing something out of my own protection? Is messing with this going to actually cause more stress and more issues? Usually when you get metabolic function good, iron levels start to even out. You don't have to take iron. You don't have to be like, oh, I like, I have to restore my iron levels. Like your body's like, dude, I get iron from everything. I've been keeping it low for a reason, buddy. You know, so um, I, I take a more trust the body approach because I've just seen iron cause a lot of more, like it just feeds parasites. Like honestly, like if you want to poop out a bunch of worms, like take, take a bunch of iron long term. A lot of doctors don't actually know that. Um, when I talked to my doctor about it, she was like, oh really? You know, like what? <laughs> so it's just kind of, um, you know, obviously you want to listen to your doctor, but um, usually iron is low for a reason, not the actual cause of a problem. I deal with hypothyroidism and I'm in the process of cleaning up my diet. What are some of your go-to meals for some ideas? Yeah, so I like, I've always said, I'm a very simple eater. Like I don't have the time right now to do super elaborate meals. So I do a lot of bone broth. I do a lot of smoothies with collagen as my protein in them. Um, I do a lot of raw milk, like, um, sometimes I'll drink raw milk for like literally a snack cause it has protein, fat and carbs. I do lots of fruit with cheese, um, Greek yogurt with like honey and berries. I do a lot of pasta raised eggs, like hard boiled eggs with a side of like fruit. Like I'll have something in season. Like I got some wonderful peaches at the store the other day and they were super ripe. And so I've just been like using that as my fruit lately. Um, I'll sometimes do like quick little turkey, like turkey and cheese wrap um, and have some fruit on the side. Or um, if I want some vegetables and I feel like some vegetables, I'll do that. I do um, like potatoes, whether it's roasted or, um, um, like smashed, baked, um, whether that's sweet potatoes or regular potatoes or Japanese yams, I just kind of mix it up. I do carrots, I do um, white fish or shellfish. Um, once a week I do oysters uh, for the for the nutrients. I, that's like my multivitamin for the week. I just do smoked ones. Um, I'll do like liver once in a while, steak once in a while, grass-fed beef. Like I just really mix it up, like the basics. Like they're just very nutrient-dense foods. Like a lot of times I do like one pot meals. So I'll like saute some grass-fed beef and some onions and then I'll throw in some um you know broccoli or whatever and then I'll put that over potatoes <laughs> and call it a day like I just take my main basics and make it into a bunch of different meals and then if I'm like feeling like it I'll go a little further and make like you know I was feeling like some pad thai the other day so I made some pad thai with butternut squash it was really good um so I just kind of like use foods that I know work for my body and then I like look at a recipe online whatever I'll type in like paleo or keto and I'll just use it as a loose template to like make my own concoction but yeah I, I really don't do like I'm trying to think of like meals that I actually make like oh like a roasted chicken I guess and I'll put like carrots and potatoes and onions at the bottom um and just like roast the whole thing um I love chicken skin it's so good I know I'm gross like a lot of people are like that's so gross and I'm like glycine bitches I love my liver um trying to think of what else I do like one pot I do a lot of like one pot one pan meals I do hamburgers like at least once a week meatballs or meatloaf once a week because I can like mix stuff into it um and it can be really versatile stir fries over white rice just like some bell peppers and onions sauteed some um chicken that's marinated um in some you know coconut aminos or gluten-free soy sauce and over just some plain white rice like you know keep it really simple I always just stick to a, a template of protein fat and carbs and um yeah I just I kind of eat simply honestly what do you think about inositol for PCOS like ovocetol I got my first normal length cycle in a year while taking it that's wonderful. Inositol can be wonderful. Like remember how I said B vitamins are very important in women with PCOS? It's because um, 
stress depletes you of B vitamins. And remember, inositol is just vitamin B8. So a lot of times we're deficient in a lot of vitamin B vitamins, but inositol can get utilized while under stress quite a lot. This is why a lot of women with PCOS seem to see a lot of benefit from it. Um, it's because they have depleted it because their bodies are under such incredible metabolic stress. So inositol and ovocetol, that's why it works for some women really well and doesn't work for some women at all. It just really depends on the person, but that's wonderful that inositol is helpful. It's usually pretty helpful. What to do about stubborn lower body fat? Um, if it's in the stomach, well, remember you guys, first of all, here's the deal. When it comes to body fat, a lot of people just immediately or automatically see body fat as a bad thing. And I'm like, girl, you have a specific amount of body fat that your body needs on its body at all times in order to feel safe, have a cycle, have a period, make progesterone. You have to understand, I'm going to show you something. So, you know, I don't have like a super lean belly for a reason. Um, my body needs to keep me at a certain body fat percentage, which is usually around like 21 to 23%. This is where I stay at all of the time. I can force myself to be leaner, but I immediately start to see my cycles get irregular. And that's my body's sign that, nope, it's too much. So weight loss is very relative to the person and the amount of body fat that you need is important. That lower pooch right here is your um, vital organs. So remember like having roles like that is actually usually a good thing for a woman because your womb is right there, right? Your uterus, your ovaries. So, you know, this idea that we're comparing, I mean, I'm sure you probably follow a million girls that show you their flat stomachs and this and that because they're working their angles, right? You're comparing yourself to a magical unicorn that doesn't exist. And so here you think that your lower body fat is stubborn or bad and your body's like, dude, I'm not going to lose it. I'm going to fight you at every moment because I need it to survive. And so you need to get real with yourself if it's excess body body fat or if it's the body fat that your body needs. Fat is not bad. Um, too much is bad and um, is actually better to lose slowly. So get yourself metabolically healthy and your body will find its healthy weight, whatever that is. And if you find that you have to actually force yourself to lose lower body weight, that is probably weight that your body does not want to lose. And I don't care if it's societally acceptable or you need a certain lean body in order to um, f like feel like you fit in with the, what the world says you need to do. That is not what your body thinks. Your body just doesn't understand this is not a famine. Like your body's like, shit, it's a famine. Like we gotta, we gotta save everything. We gotta survive. And your body doesn't realize that you're like trying to restrict calories in order to lose a few pounds, you know? Like that doesn't make sense to your body in a survival perspective. So, you know, if you just have like a few pounds to lose or you have more curvy hips and thighs, that might just be your body and learn to embrace it and enjoy it. If it's very like, so if you're talking about like lower belly fat that's very concentrated in hips and thighs, very cellulite -y, very chunky, very cottage cheesy, that's a different story. That's an estrogen, that's estrogen fat. Remember that, you know, a certain amount of fat is necessary for a woman to breastfeed and reproduce and have healthy cycles and just for her body to feel not stressed out but then there's like a too much fat where fat's just creating more estrogen and more inflammation and the body's just storing so much in these fat cells and then fat itself creates more estrogen which is a fat promoting hormone so you know it's it's very important to see things for what they are if it's just that you have a curvier body and you store more fat in your lower body enjoy it embrace it everyone loves it um and if it is um more like hormonal fat or really um more fat than is necessary then that might be something that is a sign that your metabolism is struggling and it's not that you need to focus on losing lower belly fat you just need to focus on you know promoting a healthy metabolism and the fat usually takes care of itself your body every woman's body has a certain set weight point and some women do better with more fat storage on their body unfortunately um i shouldn't say unfortunately it's just a lot of women that want to be a certain body type will never be that way unless they really force and starve themselves. And um, it's not a good thing to do. Random question, but I found a lump under my armpit about a month ago and hasn't gone away. Have you had this or any patients that have had something similar? First of all, you guys, I'm not a doctor. And if you're worried about something like that, that is definitely something you want to get checked by your doctor. Um, I don't have patients. I have clients. And so I'm more of like a wellness consultant. I'm not like a doctor. I don't tell like if you have a lump in your armpit, I encourage you to go to your doctor. 
Um, if it's something that's not serious and they test it for like a cancerous thing, because that's something you definitely don't want to let just go long term. Like you must check and make sure that's nothing that is um, cancerous or um, anything that could be malignant. And then once that's passed, you can then go on to ask if there is things you can do about reducing a lump. But the first step is to make sure it's not something that is damaging. Um, and then if it isn't, then it could be lymph tissue. It could be your lymph system. You remember you have lymph nodes right there. It's, it's messed up and you need to drain it. You can use castor oil packs. Um, body brush can be helpful detox baths just like really hot epsom salt baths um but yeah i would check that out first and foremost my doctor said my ovaries don't show pcos but i have high male hormone what does that mean please help my ovaries don't have anything on them but my male hormone is really high does male hormone ever lower itself first of all you guys testosterone is not male hormone both females and males have male hormones or androgens and testosterone and DHEA are protective in the tissues. Um, a lot of times women have high testosterone because they have high estrogen. They're not making enough progesterone. They're not ovulating. I mean, there's a million reasons why someone can have high testosterone. And so, um, it, it, it's important to get to the root cause of why the testosterone's high and not like ask why, how can I get the testosterone lower? Like it's more about why is this happening in the first place? Um, which is what I'm going to teach you guys how to figure out and fully nourish. I'm just working on the module or the lesson right now that talks about how all the hormones of your metabolism fit together, how the gut and liver play a role, um, and how stress hormones are usually the driver of metabolic dysfunction and, um, high androgens. OMG, thank you. I'm 5'8", and I never go below 160 pounds unless I'm sick or restricting food. Yeah, I mean, weight is, like, so irrelevant, you guys, too. Like, I always laugh. I'm like, your liver weighs three pounds. Your bones should be really heavy. If they're not, there's something wrong. You know, like, weight is so, like, it can fluctuate between 15 pounds on any given day, depending on, like, if you had carbs yesterday, if you had water in your muscles, like, if you took a dump, you know? Like, there's just a million things that could, like, you can immediately make yourself four pounds lighter by just releasing everything out of your digestive system. So I just don't understand why weight is even a marker for us to determine our worth or our health. Like it's just such a useless marker. Like I don't care if I weigh a hundred and you know, 90 pounds or 120 pounds, as long as I look and feel healthy. And um, we tend to focus on things that are just irrelevant and obsess over them. And weight is one of those things. It's literally irrelevant. It is based on so many factors. And I really recommend only weighing yourself, you know, if you're going to weigh yourself and you must weigh yourself once a month, if that. Um, when is your guide coming out? I'm so excited for it. Yeah, so Fully Nourished is going to be an online course. It has modules and lessons, handouts. It's not just a printable guide. It's actually going to be me on videos and slides walking you through the blueprint of how to heal your metabolism. That's why it's been taking so long. It's not just going to be like a PDF guide. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that you're equipped with everything that you need to truly start like healing and get what you where you need to go. And sometimes healing takes time, you guys. Like it's not going to be an easy transition, especially if you've been following like all this like mainstream health and wellness advice of like eat a ton of salads and green smoothies and restrict all this food and, you know, do AIP and this and that. Like you're going to be really shocked as to what is healthy on a metabolic level. And I'm just explaining the science to you. I'm going to educate you about food so that you understand how to find food that works for your body. Everyone is so different. And I want you to be able to really see through the BS that is the dieting world. Because at the end of the day, diet culture makes people money and they will convince you that you need to do this new diet or this new diet in order to make money and put money in their pockets and you are the ones that are left picking up the pieces of where that new diet left you and so my goal is to educate you surrounding food i'll definitely encourage you to and teach you how to build a plate and tell you what foods to to look out for and what foods are nutrient dense and kind of break through all those those weird things that you've learned probably over the course of years that you're going to just be mind blown like when i tell you that eggs and dairy are some of the most easy proteins to digest in your liver 
needs protein to be able to function properly. Sometimes dairy and eggs can be the best foods for supporting liver detoxification. Like, have you ever heard that before? No, because people say like, you need to eat kale in order to detox your liver. So like, I'm going to actually be teaching you the science of your body so that you can actually be in awe of your body first, learn to appreciate your body and give it what it needs for maybe the first time in your whole entire life. And then to actually take it through the healing process. Because unfortunately, if you have a, a lifelong, um, I guess, track record of uh, damaging your body metabolically, transitioning to a metabolically stable diet takes time and can sometimes be a little bit of a rough transition. So I'm going to teach you how to, you know, transition from uh, the diet that you might be currently on into something that's more going to be metabolically supportive long term. And it can sometimes be rough and bumpy. You can kind of get like weird irregular cycles. You can see hair fall out at first. Like you can feel really sick and not well because your body's actually detoxifying and it's something called herxing. And so, you know, I'm going to walk you through all that stuff. And that's why Fully Nourished is taking a while. So um, my assistant is on vacation for the next two weeks. And I was going to try to get it out before she got home. And I just, you know, she's not, I, I won't be able to do it alone. So it's going to be, she comes back on May 1st. And so um, I'm almost done with it. It's not quite done yet, but it's, you know, the finishing touches are being placed upon it. So just know it's like, it's almost out there. I'm going to give you guys a specific date really soon. I just like don't want to say a specific date because I keep doing that. And then I'm like, oh shoot, like something came up this week and I barely worked on it. So um, until I like see the end in sight, I'm going to like not say a date, but I'm thinking like beginning of May, mid-May, like it's almost there. Like you're not going to have to wait that much longer. I'm, I'm working on it every single day, by the way. Like I've been actually working on it like very a lot lately. So it's time to just keep going. <laughs> I'm using Diminovacetol. I've seen a little bit of change, but not drastic. My period is still 40 days and still not ovulating any tips. It seems like just low carb will help me with insulin resistance. Yeah, I just talked about Dim um, and Ovacetol in my last uh, talk, so make sure you watch that live. But, you know, taking supplements doesn't fix the issue. Supplements don't outweigh a bad diet or too much stressors that are causing metabolic stress. P2S is a very complicated condition and it takes, it's just a metabolic syndrome, you guys, and it's a hypometabolic state. Your metabolism is just malfunctioning and it needs to be healed. It doesn't need to be catered to. So there's a difference. There's a lot of diets like low carb diets. This is the biggest thing amongst PCOS um, women right now is, is low carb and even keto diets are being promoted. And in the short term, it can cause symptom reduction. But that is a different scenario than actual cellular healing. When you're actually catering to a damaged metabolism by restricting what it cannot burn because it's damaged, you're not fixing the issue, right? You're just removing something. It's like, it's like saying that you know, something is on fire. And so instead of putting the fire out, you just, you just remove yourself from the whole situation. You're just like, okay, bye. You know, it's like, why would you do that? Why don't we just put the fire out? It's going to take some time. It's going to take some extra effort. It's going to be like, you know, probably annoying a little bit. It's not going to be pretty. Like putting a fire out takes some work and probably gets, get some soot on your face and it's going to be hard and like mentally draining, but you're going to do it. And then you don't ever have to worry about like you burning alive ever again. Whereas if you just let the fire keep burning and you fix the symptoms, but don't actually start reversing the symptoms, it's just going to pop up in different ways. And I find that with a lot of women with PCOS, they like go on this diet and they feel good for like a year. And then they're like, I feel horrible again. And their symptoms start popping up. And then it's this new diet and it just becomes this process. It's like this really never ending process. And so that's why I've really set out to help women heal their metabolisms and learn about their hormones and metabolisms so that they can actually like heal. Because I believe that you're the true healer. I'm not a healer. Um, your doctor is not a healer. You're a healer. And in order to heal your own body, you need to understand your own body. How do you expect to heal something that you do not understand? You can't, you won't, because you don't understand what's even happening in the first place. So how can you correct an issue that you don't even know is happening? So that's what I'm on a, on a, you know, a journey to do. And, and my goal here is not necessarily to always just tell you what to 
do. And I know a lot of women like that. They like restriction. They like when people tell them you need to do this, this, and this, and this. But I find that it ends up with more confusion and it ends up with more restriction, with more depression, with more anxiety. Because now you, you're you following, you're doing every decision that you make is based on a rule that you've been taught, not actually something that's based on science or your body's telling you. And so I'm going to teach you guys how to retap into your body's wisdom, learn to listen to your, you know, nutrition intuition, if you want to call it that. I love rhyming things. Um, and um, actually heal your metabolism. It's going to happen slower, you guys, because actual proper weight loss should happen slow. You should not be burning through fat cells very quickly because everything, when you open up that fat cell, everything in that fat cell is released, including the estrogens, including the toxins, which can end up promoting more weight gain in the future, damaging your thyroid. This is why so many times low calorie or carb restrictive diets don't end up working long term and you end up gaining it all back is because a low carb diet further damages your metabolism doesn't actually fix the problem. But that was a long rant for saying that um, DIM and Ovacetol are not going to fix the problem and PC your PC PCOS could be driven by a myriad, a, a, a thousand different things. And so it's important to understand what could be causing stress on your individual system, removing that stress, and then allowing your body to finally do its thing by giving it the right tools and moving out of the way to let it do its thing. Never been so excited for a course. I'm so glad. Me too, you guys. Like, I've gotten to the point where I'm just, like, ready for this to be out for you guys. Like, I'm just ready. Like, I'm, like, so annoyed that I don't have it done yet. And I know I can only do so much in a day, but I'm, like, literally, like, the other day, I stayed up until 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was, like oh shoot, I stayed up super late, but I had, like, I'm just like, I want to get this out to you so bad because I want you to have this information. And I have so many of you wanting to work with me and I have a waiting list of like 40 people and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like I can't help enough clients. Like I'm packed out at clients already. And so this course will be, a a allow me to help more people because it's literally what I take my clients through. If my clients are coming to me and they're like, Jessica, I'm done with diets. I'm done with everything I've tried. I've experimented with a million different things and I'm just ready. This is what I do with them. When they've hit the end of their rope and they're ready for metabolic healing and they're ready to ditch the dieting, because a lot of my clients are not. They're not ready to ditch. And I have to use my intuition and say they're not quite ready yet, unfortunately. Like I have to kind of work on them slowly because they're just not mentally ready. But this is kind of what I teach somebody that has come to me and is like, I'm done. I'm ready. I want to finally heal. I want to stop doing all these freaking weird diets and restrictive diets. And I want to actually get to the root cause of the problem and do the work. And that's what Fully Nourished is. It's it's for people that are done with all this mainstream health information that has really ruined them and made them so confused around trusting their own in intuition. Is it a limited spot that I can get the guide? Uh, no, so it's not gonna be limited. It's gonna be open. The only thing is I will be offering hundred dollars off for the first two weeks Just to thank you guys for waiting for so long and being so patient like I just Appreciate your guys's patience with me like this is the first time I've ever, I've ever I've ever launched something like this and also like I know there's probably gonna be a few bumps in the road Like I understand that I'm, I'm probably not gonna get perfect first shot even though I want to So if there's like problems in the course or you know the Facebook group is you know, you're not getting your questions answered like I'm gonna try to make as much catering to you as possible but I know that there's gonna be bumps and so I just want to extend that hundred dollars off for the people that are gonna probably deal they're gonna be signing up in the first two weeks that course has ever existed and so they're probably gonna deal with a few bumps along the road and it's just a thank you for being patient and for um, working with me and you know allowing me to do this journey with you what are you saying? What you're saying is so true. After six months of keto, my anxiety was through the roof. After adding fruit back in, I'm feeling so much better and less stressed. It's amazing. It's not even hard to eat nutrient dense foods and it's so much better than dieting. Absolutely. So going by how you feel is so much better than going by what the scale is saying because I've seen so many people that like start eating met metabolically healing foods like fruits and dairy and they're seeing the weight kind of creep up at first and they're like oh, shoot like I'm gaining and as long as you're transitioning properly which I will teach you in the course like I'll teach you like I'm not a big fan of counting calories but I do think that if you're eating a certain amount of calories like sometimes you can dramatically under like if you start eating a different way you can dramatically increase your calories or you might dramatically reduce your calories without knowing it and that can really stress your body out even more so I'm going to teach you how to like properly transition just to make sure you're kind of staying in the same calorie range 
stage as you were before um, because calories are just energy right and if you're doing too much energy or too little energy too quickly it can be like whoa the body's like wait so um, you want to slowly increase your fuel you also want to make sure you're hitting the right macro micronutrients and macronutrients you know uh, you have to get used to knowing what a hundred grams of protein a day looks like you need to understand what your personal carbohydrate intake needs to be sometimes it's upwards of 150 to 250 it just kind of depends so um, it's very important is it okay to have 40 day cycles with consistent ovulation and two to three day periods on a healthy individual yeah if, I mean if you're ovulating and you feel great I wouldn't have a problem with it at all. How do we sign up for your course? Um, in the link in my bio, there is a VIP access list, so you would sign up for the VIP list, but my course is not out yet. It I will make sure nobody misses it. When my course is out, you will know it's out. I'm kind of starting to talk about information more that's gonna be in the course, so a lot of my posts um, coming up to the course and a lot of my Instagram stories and everything will be kind of hinting to you guys at like what's in the course. Like I'll be talking about subjects that will be included in the course just so you guys are starting to understand what Fully Nourish will be all about. And then I will also be doing a Q&A that's just about Fully Nourish. So for people that are interested in, in actually signing up for Fully Nourish, they can come ask whatever questions that you want to. Because I want to make sure that this is something that's going to benefit you too. Like I'm not trying to just shill you a course and be like, uh, I hope it works for you. Bye. Like I want to make sure this is going to work for you or I want to give you your money back like I'm not gonna be like oh sorry like you know I, this course is created to help you and so I want to make sure it's the right fit and so the only way to do that is to really allow you to ask all the questions you need and to be prepared and so you know keep your eye out for it but I will make sure that everyone knows when it's out how much will the course cost it's gonna be 287 but it's gonna be a hundred dollars off the first two weeks so it's gonna be 287 dollars because it's about uh, equal to working with me for about four to eight sessions just depending um uh yes so the course will be out soon but instagram's cutting me off you guys thank you so much for joining me and i'm so appreciative for you spending your time with me i hope you enjoyed this q a and i love you guys let's see oopsie